Well, Joe has already expressed his appreciation for this series, and I too want to express my appreciation for this series too. This opportunity to get to know the book of Ruth more intimately than I think I ever have up to this point. How about that? But I do confess something. I confess that it hasn't been easy for me. I have wrestled, and yes, pastors wrestle with Scripture. I wrestle with some of the stories of the Bible, this being one of them. I grew up knowing Ruth through the, the, um, the well-known pledge that she gave to Naomi, which is lovely and noble to pull out. But as I've grown older, I became aware and unsettled with a patriarchal culture that made it such that there needed to be laws such as these to take care of Ruth and Naomi, of the marginalized. So I am stirred to the point of anger when the patriarchy of that day seeps through the calculated and risky actions Ruth takes in order to secure a future that felt safe for her and Naomi. So I consider it a spiritual discipline for me to dig deeper, to keep searching for the hope in this and one of the difficult stories in the Bible. But I can stand here and honestly say this morning that I have valued this deep dive and I have found hope. This last chapter, chapter four, is the bookend to the beginning of the story, bringing hope and new life to what was a story of great loss and grief in the beginning. What began as displacement within a climate crisis because of a severe drought concludes with plenty both in the literal harvest that was reaped, but also in Boaz following through or offering and following through on his oath to Ruth made on the threshing floor that we uh, worked through last week. So the city gate is where chapter four opens. This place where the business with the elders occurs. And Boaz was full of knowledge of the religious and social laws of the day, and he knew where he needed to go in order to make things right, to secure security for Ruth and Naomi. So in this scene, Boaz is depicted as somewhat casual, as he says to the next of kin, the kinsman redeemer, hey friend, or otherwise known, I think, as, as I've read through some of the commentaries as, hey so-and-so, kind of this um, informal term that he called the kinsman redeemer. And he continues leading with great intentionality orchestrating the gathering of the kinsman redeemer and the elders so that there were eyewitnesses there to see this and hear this transaction based on the law. A law that is to ensure care for widows like Naomi. Oh, and in this case, Elimelech's widow and Ruth as her subsequent daughter-in-law. So Boaz is strategic here, and he's very measured in the amount of information that he gives each step of the way. So as he approaches the kinsman redeemer and explains the situation, the available land, and that he has the opportunity to buy this land, to carry on the name of Elimelech and Naomi as being a part of this. 
Because it's not until after the kinsman redeemer says, sure, I'll take that land, I will buy that, that there's any mention of Ruth. So after the kinsman redeemer says yes, Boaz continues to add the details about caring for Ruth and making sure to carry on the lineage through bearing children with her. At this point, the kinsman redeemer backs away. He saw Ruth as a foreigner and a threat, and he says as much. He's a threat. She is a threat to my property or a risk. This is too big of a risk for me. And he declines following through as being kinsman redeemer. That leaves the next of kin as Boaz. And so as a symbol of passing the kinsman redeemer's responsibility from one to the next, this gentleman passes his sandal to Boaz. And as Boaz was smart from the very beginning to have the elders there, the elders witness this passing of the sandal and it was seen as a binding agreement between the two of them and ends with the elders offering their blessing to Boaz. So how was it that Boaz didn't see Ruth as a threat as this other kinsman redeemer did? In fact, we've walked through some of these uh, actions that Boaz took in seeing that he never seemed to see her as a threat. From the moment he noticed her gleaning in his fields and found out who she was and what her story was, Boaz sought to create a safe place for both Ruth and Naomi to settle. Boaz witnessed the virtuous love and loyalty that Ruth had for her mother-in-law. Her very being shined greater than her Moabite foreigner status or any possible risk that she would have upon Boaz. So what was it about Boaz and who he was that led him to care? In this chapter and in the whole book, Boaz is depicted as having a virtuous character, holding his power and privilege with a deep sense of responsibility for his farm, his profession, the responsibility as an employer, but also in his deep faith. He knew God's law but he also allowed God's spirit to form the heart of the law deep within him. Now, we read Naomi naming Boaz as the kinsman redeemer, but I just wonder if Boaz knew his familial relationship with Naomi once he heard Ruth's story. For he so easily extended this protection to Ruth, giving explicit instructions to his workers to honor Ruth's efforts, as if creating this, uh, the, the spirit of the law already around them. Carissa has done a wonderful job this morning of opening up again this word of chesed, and that English doesn't quite do it justice. And it is seen in both Ruth's actions and Boaz. To fill this word out, chesed, chesed inspires merciful and compassionate behavior towards another. Chesed surpasses ordinary kindness and friendship. Chesed runs deeper than social expectations, 
responsibilities, perhaps fluctuating emotions, or what is deserved or earned. This is Boaz's response. Boaz was embodying chesed. And herein lies one of the hopes for me. God's law here was not designed to keep Moabites out, or any others for that matter, or to have an elite following. God's law was to create a framework to which Boaz, uh, Boaz's very being could be nourished through compassion and grace. Boaz's personhood became the springboard to offer the same to Ruth and Naomi, regardless of their race, economic status, or history. And thus, Boaz didn't see an immigrant or even an enemy, but rather he saw family. And not only that, Ruth's example of chesed towards Naomi was praised being worth more than seven sons. In a patriarchal society as this was, the sons were valued greatly. She was worth more than seven sons announced by the women who gave Naomi a blessing in this chapter. I find it interesting, though, that Obed isn't necessarily a blood grandson of Naomi, for it was Ruth's husband that was Naomi's son. But because of how they uh, drew the lineage through the males, and because of Ruth's chesed towards Naomi, Obed is her grandson. Now, Boaz grew up with an oral tradition of his faith. And not only that, but of his family lineage. And therefore, that's where I draw some of my assumption that Boaz may have very well known who Naomi was. But this also means that he would have known about the stories that the elders referred to in verses 11 and 12 in their blessing, invoking Rachel, Leah, and Tamar's names. This, for me, not only acknowledges the importance of women in the patriarchal system and their acknowledgement of the importance of women in carrying on the lineage, but it also includes other stories of conception that are laced with trickery at worst, an imperfection at its best. And if you want to familiarize yourself with these stories once again, they're found in Genesis 29 and 38. That can be your afternoon, afternoon reading. What we know of their genealogy is that Ruth and Boaz's son's lineage leads to David, and that is, that is drawn out for us at the very end of chapter 4 here. And then David's lineage leads to Jesus. So the other text we heard this morning is Mary's Magnificat. And perhaps an unlikely time to hear it. However, there are threads of similarities between Ruth and Mary. Ruth was an unlikely recipient of such generosity of grace and compassion within this context. Yet she exemplified chesed. Mary was a young virgin, also an unlikely participant in continuing the lineage and the story of God's redemption. She also was a woman embodying God's chesed. Both women of valor. The blessing of the women to Naomi and Mary's song both offer praise to the God who offers loving kindness, who offers 
chesed to God's people. As I've held this story, I have wondered about our own cultural and religious context. I can lament the patriarchy of Ruth's day, but also know full well we still have structures and a culture that is built on patriarchy. A culture in which needs laws in which to care for the vulnerable. It's easy to come down hard and negative. I believe a gleaning from Boaz is about being aware of one's power and privilege within a system for which Boaz seems to be aware in this story and uses it to the benefit of Ruth. So for us, some of these questions that I think we need to grapple with and ponder as we name and become aware of the power and privilege that we have in our own time. Consider some of these questions. What are the various spheres of influence that you hold in your family, profession, church, and neighborhood? What power does your gender, skin color, economic, and educational status give you without even asking for it? How are you cultivating your awareness of the people around you, their stories, and their needs? One came to mind for me this past week as I have learned that Open Doors does not have a place to settle right now because they are renovating a new site. And that leaves many of our friends in this area without shelter at night. So how are we informing ourselves of these stories, of our neighbors who struggle? Another question, what are the names we use to describe who and what we see? Do you find the words lazy, crazy, felon, addict, scammer, or leechers of the system in your vocabulary? Or do you find friend, sister, brother, Personal, personal awareness of one's power in, and influence is beneficial. But another gleaning is that of cultiva- cultivating one's spiritual practices to nurture God's loving kindness within our beings. In other words, how are you opening your spirit to receive God's hesed for you? What are your spiritual practices that nourish your chesed of self? And what are ways that you are cultivating chesed for others, especially on the margins? In the book of Ruth, it is this loving kindness embodied in the people that carries it on. It was mentioned other Sundays, and I came across this myself in my reading. God is not mentioned explicitly within the book of Ruth. But rather, it is communicated that God was at work in the people, in the ordinary, day to day, and through each person's act of loving kindness towards the other. So, sisters and brothers, what is clear in this book is that God's gracious, merciful, loving kindness, otherwise known as God's chesed, 
is for all and endures forever. It endured before Rachel and Leah, before Tamar and Ruth, before Mary and Elizabeth, before Teresa of Avila and Julian of Norwich, before Mother Teresa and Maya Angelou. And it continues in you and I today. You and I, through our everyday interactions, have the opportunity to offer God's chesed to ourselves and to others. This is a form of worship, honoring our Creator, the one who offers loving kindness and graciousness and compassion to us. We, the bearers of God's compassionate grace, are also in need of God's grace. When we don't have the wisdom, wisdom to act with such loving kindness. So I invite you to join me in the confessions written in your bulletin, and you'll find it up on the screen as well, as we acknowledge our shortcomings. Day and night we cry out to God for help. We ask for food for the hungry, power for the powerless, justice for the oppressed. In the middle of the night, our hearts cry out, God, do something, make things right, grant us peace, change the world. In those moments of darkness, God asks us to participate in creating a more righteous and peaceful world. We confess that too often we look for a miracle when our hands and hearts can be God's means of granting justice. The God who made heaven and earth helps us to live justly. Emboldened by God's strength, we remain steadfast in our pursuit of what is right and holy and just. Friends, it is possible for this love to shine in each of us beyond borders, beyond so social order, beyond economic status, racial background, gender, family system, beyond last name, beyond all circumstances. For God's chesed endures forever. And to this we say, thanks be to God. And by God's grace and wisdom, we will carry it wherever we go. Amen.